Well, we are in the final week of our series called The Resurrected Life, and we're going to look at one last story. It's a story of James, the brother of Jesus. It's a beautiful comeback story, and, uh, and I love comeback stories. Uh, generally, people love comeback stories. We love them in sports, right? If you're a Dodger fan, you have the Kirk Gibson home run, except for the people whose brake lights are all hitting as they're listening to the game on the radio as they miss the greatest home run hit in World Series history. But Angel fans, you guys know, I think you have the most underrated uh, World Series home run ever, Scott Spezio's home run in game six of the World Series. Now, if you rewatch it, it's a, there's a fascinating thing. Uh, I just was uh, told this story by a friend of mine. Uh, the pitcher at the time was a guy named Russ Ortiz. He was pitching a great game that uh, uh, Dusty Baker went out to take the ball from him. And Dusty told him, no, you keep the ball. That's going to be a special ball someday. And he held on to it. He walked off. Of course, the next pitcher came in. Spezio homered. Game seven. Angels, you have your first uh, World Series title. And uh, my friend who's friends with Russ Ortiz says, yeah, he did keep that ball. It is a special ball. And it's a weird reminder of what didn't happen. Uh, we love comeback stories. Uh, the Patriots coming back from 28-3. We don't love that one as much, but uh, we love them in sports. We love them in entertainment, right? Movies like Shawshank Redemption or The Pursuit of Happiness, uh, TV shows like Sherlock or West Wing. Uh, we, we love these shows that remind us to be resilient and have hope and not give up no matter what the odds are. Uh, we love historical figures. We love to teach our kids about people like Harriet Tubman and Helen Keller, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Edison. Uh, we think about the lives that they had and then the lives that became uh, to be free, to, to escape slavery and to lead countless others into freedom, to not be able to, to, uh, uh, to be deaf and blind, but then to become an author and an advocate uh, for those with disabilities, uh, to fail miserably and then to become some of the greatest at what you do. These are the kind of stories we love. In sports, you don't leave early, right? You don't want to be that guy whose brake lights are on. In entertainment, we love to leave the theater buzzing because our hearts are moved by what could happen. In history and in life, uh, we want to tell the next generation these stories because those stories can be their stories as well, and they inspire us. Um, they inspire us not to give up on ourselves. But be honest, you do all the time, don't you? You give up on yourself. Uh, you give up on yourself because sometimes you're just exhausted. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, sometimes you give up on yourself because you fear rejection or you fear failure. Sometimes you give up on yourself because you lack the support you need. But those same reasons are reasons why we give up on others. Uh, sometimes we give up on others because we're just exhausted at trying. Uh, thinking change will come and just thinking it's never going to come. Uh, we're overwhelmed by repeated failure or repeated rejections. Over time, we lose interest. Uh, and, and what I want you to see in this last story is that while we might give up on ourselves and others might give up on us, uh, the truth is that Jesus doesn't give up on us. This is our final big idea in our series, that Jesus doesn't give up on us. That what others do, and we might ourselves, Jesus will not give up on us. And today we're going to see in this last story, this fascinating story, how Jesus did not give up on his brother James. And if he doesn't give up on us, my hope is in some ways we will be inspired about the people God has put in our lives and we won't give up on them. And so let me invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 in the Bibles uh, in front of you. It's on page 933. Uh, we have been thinking over this season since Easter, we've been looking at the stories uh, that Acts 1 tells us that for 40 days, Jesus continued to appear to his followers. Uh, to give convincing proofs that he was alive again. Uh, and in this, uh, we are reminded that this resurrected life, that he has been risen, that one day we will be risen. And so in the middle, between these points, we are learning what it looks like to live a resurrected life. And so I want us to read this uh, passage again and be reminded of verse 58 uh, that we uh, said on Easter, that there were three things through this series we want to think about. How do we stand firm in our faith? How do we let nothing move us? And how do we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord? Because we know our labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the call. So let's read the passage that started us off. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. It says this, 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Now, this is one of the most important chapters of the Bible. It's one of the most important passages of the Bible because it reminds us of what is of first importance to our faith. The the New Testament is clear that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, but God raised him from the dead. And what Paul is putting an emphasis here on is that there there are eyewitness testimonies. And he begins to list a number of people in a number of groups. And his point of saying all these things is that he wants you to be able to understand that these people that he is mentioning, most of whom are still alive. And so for those in Corinth who are wrestling with their faith, that they could actually, if you, if you could, you could actually go find these people. You could ask these people about their experiences with the risen Jesus, and they would testify to you. But I want to draw your attention to verse 7, five words in English, uh, a very small part of this passage, but a very important part of our day. Verse 7 says, Then he appeared to James. James is the brother of Jesus, Uh, He led the church in Jerusalem while Peter and Paul and others were taking the gospel uh, throughout the world. James became one of the key leaders of the early church. And in Acts 12 and Acts 15, we see his unique leadership. James was a pillar in the church, but it wasn't always like that. What changed in James? So I want you to think about this for a, a second. Imagine being the younger brother of Jesus, right? So imagine your older brother is, is Jesus, and uh, as you are growing up and living, uh, we, we don't know a lot about Jesus. We know uh, about his birth. We know about his dedication. We know that at 12, uh, he was fascinating the religious leaders about his knowledge of scripture. He got left behind in a caravan. Uh, they found him in this. But uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, Hebrews 4 says this, that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So I want you to think about whatever stage of life you're in, I want you to think about different stages that you've already experienced and try to think about those, the temptations in different stages of life. The scripture says that Jesus faced all of those temptations and yet was without sin. That person, that perfect person, is your older brother. Uh, if you think about this, think about the, the unique way that here, here he is. You're thinking maybe he's a, he seems a little different than everyone else, right? He, he doesn't get frustrated at the things that other people get frustrated with. He, he seems to always do the right thing at the right time. People really like him and you like him and that shouldn't bother you, but it does. Like he just always seems to be, like if there was any person you're growing up with and there's any person who you just thought he just seems to be the model of what it means to be truly human, it's my big brother. And this is what James is growing up with and certainly all the ideas of what it means, uh, of what God is doing, the stories he must have learned. And, and James is watching all this and he's living with this. He, he notices that Jesus isn't gossiping. He's not sharing the tasteless jokes. He's thoughtful and caring. It's uh, everything they see in him. People love him. You love him. But you you really want him to kind of stay in the predictable box of your little family in your little town of Nazareth. But now Jesus is 30 and he begins to announce the kingdom of God has come upon us. And he's announcing it as if he is the king. And everyone is flocking to him, and everyone is celebrating him, and everyone is worshiping him as the Messiah. And people are acting as if their prayers have been answered, and their ancestors' prayers have been answered, and everything we've been waiting for is happening now with my brother. The first three chapters of Mark 
launch with an announcement. Jesus comes and says, uh, the good news, uh, I want to announce good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And then Jesus, all through those first three chapters, we see incredible teaching and incredible miracles, a demonstration that indeed the, the power of the kingdom of God is at hand and people are experiencing it. And, and it, they are drawn in it. And everyone is excited except James. And maybe what we call James is uh, an embarrassed skeptic. Mark 3 says this, that Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Right? Think about this. He is so popular that everyone is pressing in. There's no time to eat. There's just, he is constantly just trying to give attention to everyone who's, who's asking somehow, some way uh, to, to be heard by him, to be seen by him, to be uh, recognized. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Right? He is out of his mind. We need to restrain Jesus. We need to protect Jesus from himself, and we need to protect us from Jesus. And certainly there had to be fear of what the Roman authorities might think if someone goes around claiming a new kingdom and a new king are at hand. Certainly there was concern about what the religious leaders would say. Would they get kicked out of the, of the synagogue? Fear, embarrassment, and lack of faith. Mark James in these days. Now, James has got to be probably in his mid to late 20s at this point. And, and in Mark 6, we see in a few chapters over, Jesus goes back to his hometown. And listen to what happened. Jesus left there. He went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. The Sabbath came, and he began to teach in the synagogue. So he's in his home synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. So on the one hand, they're amazed. They're hearing him, and they're saying, man, this is, this is powerful stuff. But then they're confused. Where, where did he get these things, they ask. What's this wisdom that's been given him? Weren't these the, uh, what are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Such little faith. And everyone's thinking, right, that's Jesus, right? The carpenter, uh, Joseph's kid, Mary's kid, the the guy with all the brothers and sisters, like grew up down the, the road there. This is the guy? And they're trying to get their heads, and we see so little faith, that, and there's so few miracles. John chapter 7, verse 5 says, even his own brothers did not believe in him. So what's interesting as we see is James and the other brothers and sisters, they show up in different moments in Jesus' ministry, but there's no evidence ever that, that any of them actually become followers of him during his ministry. And this is why I think uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 is filled with such grace and power. That James had issues with Jesus, but Jesus did not give up on James. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, then he appeared to James. Now, I don't know what that encounter was like. I don't know if he wanted to spook his brother, like pop out of a corner. I don't know if it was a very uh, simple gathering. He was called into a place like we've seen him. Go get it, my brother. Somehow, some way, how powerful that encounter. All the years of rejecting him and now being embraced by him. This pursuit of him. Back in 1890, there was a poem called The Hound of Heaven. And it became popular because of the way that it portrayed God in his relentless pursuit of us. As if it was like a hunting dog after a rabbit, you could feel the breath of him closing in on you. And not for the sake of your demise or your destruction, but that he would find you, he would catch you, and that he would save you. That that in some ways, one of the things that we see in James is is the beauty of what happens. And and can I say for any of you, maybe you've just kind of held Jesus off at arm's distance. 
that for some ways you're like, ah, I mean, I don't know how I feel about it. That maybe you feel like you're a James. You're like, I get it. Like, it's cool for all of you, but I'm not sure what it is for me. That one of the things that we see in the beauty of James' story is this, is that what Jesus sees in you is so much more than you see in yourself. It's not just the salvation of, of, of heaven someday, but is the life being lived of full potential now and forever. And this is what happened in James's life. That James went from being the skeptic to being the anchor in the early church. And this is the story that we saw last week of Saul of Tarsus. The, the greatest... Uh, uh, most violent kind of uh, enemy of the church becomes its greatest missionary. This is Mary Magdalene, who seven demons are cast out, but is the one who is faithful there at the cross, there at the burial, and there to be first to be the witness of the resurrection. That Jesus takes these people who he is unwilling to give up on and give them a, a life in him that is so beyond anything they ever hoped for or imagined. This is the story of church history. I, I mean, we know names like St. Augustine and, and St. Francis and St. Teresa. But if you actually go back and look at their stories, uh, St. Augustine was the original party animal. But he had a mother who would not stop praying for him. Uh, St. Francis was uh, incredibly rich and lived an indulgent life until he gave it all away and began to do his work. St. Teresa uh, was an atheist in her teenage years. And yet here we are for the third time in this series, mentioning her and her work. C.S. Lewis, the great author, uh, describes himself as maybe the most reluctant convert ever in Christendom. John Newton uh, was uh, a, a sailor who sailed in the slave trade, uh, but who repented of everything he did and wrote the most famous song that we sing, Amazing Grace. Uh, a wretch who's now been saved. And, and you can go on and on through history, but, but what I think happens in both the biblical examples and the historical examples is that those people said yes to Jesus and they kept saying yes to Jesus. Amy's point last week was so brilliant that what you saw in Saul's life is the same thing you see in all these people's life is they say yes to the risen Jesus and then they keep saying yes to Jesus again and again. And the same thing is true in our church. Uh, Many of you know my wife is dyslexic. Uh, She has a processing disorder. She was told that school just wasn't for her. Uh, But she said yes to Jesus at a young age, and then every step along the way, she just kept saying yes to Jesus again and again and again. Uh, She uh, outgraded and out-awarded me at Biola University. Uh, I was introduced as an adjunct professor as Kimberly's husband uh, by by one of my mentors, as the, the, the best student ever in the teaching class that he had. And while her text might be hard to decipher that you get, uh, maybe explains a little bit more of, of, of what you get, you know she's an incredible pastor and leader. Uh, we invite you all the time into our CR ministry, and, and one of the reasons is um, so many of our leaders are just, they're, they're stories. Every one of them is a story of where they were and now where they are because they keep saying yes to Jesus again and again and again, and, and he has done immeasurably more than anything uh, they hoped or imagined. Some of you uh, remember uh, Jeff Becker, who was leading. He's part of our Huntington Beach campus as well. And, and the best way to describe Jeff's uh, story is uh, imagine Breaking Bad meets Jesus. Like Jeff's story, I hope, gets turned into a screenplay because it is crazy to say the least. But Jeff continued to say yes to Jesus again and again, and God did amazing through, things through him. Rosie, who's leading now, Rosie would tell you that the same thing. She never imagined herself doing what she's doing and helping people find their way out of their hurts and habits and hang-ups because she was immersed in all those things. But she said yes to Jesus, and she kept saying yes to Jesus, and God is using her week in and week out. Ryan Fisher was a a middle school kid that was invited here to uh, the crowd back in 2007 and then invited to camp. And you want to know why we we always encourage you, man, invite invite your friends to camp. Uh, Ryan said yes to Jesus, and she kept saying yes to Jesus. Uh, Ryan Fisher is now Ryan Speak, 
And that kid who came here in 2007 from a broken home, uh, just got her master's uh, uh, in uh, marriage and family therapy, and is going to be a therapist helping broken families become restored. And I'm convinced simply of this, is that one of the reasons why Jesus will not give up on you, why you will feel his breath on the back of your neck, because he is in hot pursuit of you, is because he knows who you can be under his care. He wants a life with you now and forever. Jesus just doesn't give up on us. He doesn't give up on us. Look, I'm like some of you here. I did not have Jesus on my bingo card. I did not have church. I had no inkling or desire to go to church and found myself here accidentally. I never imagined this life, and if you told me becoming a pastor, that was never in the cards for me. But I said yes to Jesus again and again and again. And Jesus doesn't give up on us. And that means that we don't give up on the people God has put in our lives. And so I want us to think about this as we close out our series. What would it look like for us to not give up on the Jameses in our life, those people that that matter to us, those people that we care about who have not yet decided to follow Jesus? How do we play a role in their lives? Let's think about those three things as we close. One, you stand firm in your faith. If you want to be uh, someone that God uses, and let me say this, I think God desires to use you. And if you say no, he'll find someone else uh, because he is in pursuit of that person. He is inviting you because he wants you to share in the joy of this. But the first thing we do is we stand firm in our faith. Often your character will say so much more than your words. In fact, your words will be absolutely meaningless if they are not matched with character. Uh, Many of you have read the book of James before. You've read, uh, people love it. They love it and they hate it at the same time because it's so convicting. It's so practical. James, it's as if James, uh, uh, he's a master in what he's done. He's taken the Sermon on the Mount and the book of Proverbs and he's merged them together. He's so loyal to his brother's teachings and so loyal to uh, the, the word of God. He was known as James the Just by church historians, church fathers. That's what they, they referred to him. Holiness mattered to him. And you know, in, in James 2.20, he says that, that our faith without works is dead. That, that if you're going to, to, to be an example to someone, your, your faith and your actions have to be merged together. And so we live this life together. For me, it was so powerful. Uh, uh, I experienced that when I came into the youth group. It was, it was a youth leader. And what I, I, I didn't totally understand it at the time, but I was able to reflect back later that what happened in, in that experience, that first year of, tr- of hearing the gospel and being amazed by it, but not really knowing what this was all about, I watched someone live out faith. And I remember thinking to myself later in life, wow, this guy showed me what it looks like to be a man of God. We receive this radical grace. And as a response, we offer to God ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. We stand firm in our faith. We let nothing move us. You let nothing move you. Now, the historian Eusebius records that the religious leaders of James's day they, they pressured him to get people to stop following his brother as the Messiah. In fact, uh, it's written, they, they said this to him. They said, we beseech you to restrain the people since they are straying after Jesus as though he were the Messiah. But James did the opposite. In fact, on that uh, uh, Palm Sunday, as they were celebrating the Passover that week, as it came on that day, uh, James called for the people to, to come out again into the streets and to call out Hosanna, to scream out Hosanna, to praise Jesus as the Savior who has come, the Messiah who's come to save them and to rescue them. And the authorities took James threw him down and stoned him and beat him with clubs until he died. James would not even let the threat of death 
move him from his faith. Faithful devotion, not accommodation to the culture. We stand firm. We let nothing move us. We don't just say we believe. We, we, we live as though we believe. And the final thing is we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Uh, the, the book of Acts uh, reveals the unique uh, contribution that James made to lead the church. And Acts 15 is a, a, a very important chapter in which we see James at the, really at the forefront of helping decide how all these things are going to take place as the gospel is going into the world. Now, it's not as if James did not get some things wrong. In fact, we'll see as we go into Galatians next week, there was uh, times where he even had to be corrected in his passion. Uh, but many see this, uh, the way that he gave himself. And we realize that in the same way, when we give ourselves fully, we open ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, we get, are, are ready to go wherever it is that he wants us to go. We're willing to do whatever it is that he asks us to do. Some of you, uh, like our friends Tammy and Taylor and Heidi and others who uh, you, you are willing to give your life um, to unreached and unengaged people around the world. And some of you are, 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 there's an openness in you that if God wants to use you and send you to some part of the world, that you would be willing to go to those places. I would love to, to meet with you and pray with you about this. Uh, but all of us, all of us have an, an 8 to 15. We have, we have people in a relational world, somewhere probably between 8 and 15 people. And if you just thought about it, and prayed about it, you would realize God has put people in your life in this season that if you were to pray each day to say, God, how do I bless those people today? You would see that God is inviting you all the time into people's lives to, to help some people of faith grow stronger, to help some people who've had bad experiences or who have left the church find their way back into the life of God's community, or to help people hear the gospel for the first time. Uh, what becomes hard in this is that we, uh, as we think about our 8 to 15, what it is, uh, we can feel the, those feelings of wanting to give up. That God puts someone on our heart and we begin to pray and we have an openness, we're willing and we're ready to go. And somehow in some ways, it just never seems like the, the needle's moving. Uh, as we would sit with our kids uh, and thinking about this, we would pray every night as they were just little kids, uh, all through their years, uh, we would pray every night for Kim's dad. We prayed for that man for, uh, I mean, Kim probably for over 40 years, for me over 35 years, praying for him that he would find Jesus. And he, he was a clever guy. He was a salesman. He was someone who could always kind of talk his way through as if he had a better answer than the way that Jesus came up with it or the way God was doing something in the world. Uh, he just never showed any interest. And we just prayed, and we just kept praying. And there were so many times where I just thought, this is so silly. Why are we praying? We should, like, let's just give our attention to someone else. If he's just going to keep rejecting everything, we'll just move on. But God would not allow us to move on, that he was not willing to give up on him. And watching my, my kids grow up over the years, and watching my oldest son go from a, 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 just a, a toddler and a young elementary kid who would pray every night for his pap app to becoming a young man and a pastor and sitting with his pap app and listening patiently to his concerns about faith and trying to answer his questions for him in the most gentle way and realizing all the things that I thought I, I was supposed to be able to do, watching my son be able to do it much better than me. About two years ago, her dad uh, reached out to me and he said, hey, I want to come to church. And I said, well, we're always open. Uh, you, you're welcome. And so he showed up that morning and something was just so different. He sat in the front row and I could tell when I was preaching, something was going on. He, he was holding on to Kim's hand and he was holding on to his wife's hand. And he was, he was fixed on me like I've never seen before. And, and I, I ended the message and I gave a response to, to give your life to, to Jesus and afterwards, I, I walked down, and he was crying. And his wife looked at me, and she said, Oh, Bill, the Holy Spirit is moving today. And I said, Tim, what's going on? And he just opened up that he was ready to take a step of faith. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> uh, and so we prayed together through this. And I began to watch just the subtle transformation take place 
Uh, this man who had, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of stories, but who uh, was beginning to change because he had said yes and allowed the Holy Spirit to enter his life and began to change who he was. And we said to him, you know, Tim, the next thing you have to do is, is to be baptized. Like, we should help you. And they're like, oh, he's been baptized. He's been baptized seven times. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, when he was in the army, you got a, a, a day of leave if you got baptized. So he said, I'm Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal. He started naming them all. And we said, well, we might want to try to actually do it now as a follower of Jesus, but uh, here's this man who every Sunday is now in church with his wife. Uh, they sit together, they pray together, they have this, this, this simple life. And I just look at this and think in some ways how beautiful it is, how God just will not give up on us. Jesus won't give up on you. And if you, you're running, he's going to run after you. Uh, not to destroy you, but to save you, to give you the life that he's always dreamed for you. And those people in our lives, I want to encourage you, don't give up on them. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Stand firm in your faith. Don't let anything move you. Live your faith out in, in such beautiful ways that people will give praise for what they see in you. And so as we close, we want to close with a time of communion together. Uh, we think of the, the risen Jesus gave his life for us. And on that last night of his life, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he passed a cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Eat, drink, remember me. And as we eat and we drink, we remember what it is that he would do for us. He will not give up on us. And it's the beautiful part of the communion experience is as Jesus passed the bread and the cup, he says, I will not participate in this meal until the day it is fulfilled in my kingdom. That we will eat and drink together again, but it'll be the day that I bring resurrection life to its fullness. And so as you take the bread this morning, can I ask you to thank him and to offer yourself to him? If not for the first time, for the hundred and first time, again this morning, to offer yourself in a fresh way to him. And before you take the cup, uh, let's, let God bring someone to your mind, someone that you want to pray for, and someone you just know, God, I know you're not giving up on this person, and so I'm not giving up on them either. And offer a prayer for that person. And when you're ready, you can eat, drink, and remember Jesus. And so let's pray together. Jesus, we, we worship you. We thank you. You are the one who gives us life. And so as we enter into this time to remember you, we remember that you have given your life for us. But you have been raised from the dead. You are alive. You fill us now with your spirit. And this life we have in you is beautiful. And so we pray that uh, as we end this time of worship, our celebration would be to remember our life is built now on you. May we stand firm and let nothing move us. We pray in your name. Amen.